So take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. We're going to have to review a little bit so that we make sure that we're at the right spot. And then we're going to pick up from where we were at. In the chapter 11, you have the two witnesses given to us. Remember, God told John, first of all, to measure the city and to measure the temple. And he was supposed to measure every part of it except the Gentile court because he he was going to measure what their worth is, how they were doing, what they were accomplishing at that particular time. And then it says that he would have two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. That's verse three. They will be clothed in sackcloth because they're, they're basically, you know, in, in sorrow over the condition of man and over the sinfulness of mankind. When you put on sackcloth and ashes, it was always an indication of sorrow. It was an indication of repentance. It was an indication of a desire to, to turn away from that which was evil. And these two individuals who stand before the Lord are considered to be two olive branches, olive trees. An olive tree was that which was uh, grows in Jerusalem. It was used for the oil for the lanterns that was uh, put in the temple. It was also used for medicinal purposes all throughout the land. And so you have that aspect to it, that these two witnesses stand as olive trees. They're medicinal. They give information that's going to heal, that's going to take care of many. Uh, the thing is that uh, the world won't want to follow them at all. And because of that, they're going to go against them. And scripture says, and if anyone harms them, fire will flow out of their mouth and devour their enemies, so that if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. So they're able to call down fire from heaven, just like Elijah was able to do so when the uh, Ahab sent his guards to try to get a hold of him. So they're able to call down fire and actually destroy them at that time. And the thing is that these two witnesses will perform signs and wonders. One of the signs that they are able to do is that they're able to keep it from raining. And they will able, be able to keep it from raining for three and a half years. They can call the sky when it will rain and when it will not rain. And they have power over water. Um, remember the signs that Moses was given? He was given a sign to cast his rod down and it became a snake. He had a, a sign which he touched his hand to his breast and it became leprous. And then when he touched it back again, it became whole. And then he was able to take water and to pour the water that came out of the Nile back into the Nile. And when he did, it became blood. And it was blood all throughout it. They are going to have the power to turn the waters into blood. And they will have the power also to strike the earth with every type of plague. So when you talk about plagues of locusts, when you talk about plagues of grasshoppers, when you talk about plagues of all sorts of things, they're able to bring it about when they want to, according to the power of God that has been given to them. When we were, when I was young, my mom and dad took, went across the country and we came to uh, some of the areas of Colorado and New Mexico, and they happened to have that year an infestation of grasshoppers. Now, I wasn't used to seeing but one or two grasshoppers in Southern California. Here, you could take a one foot square and you would find at least 20 in it. And you were looking at that and you go, good grief, what would you do? And eventually those grasshoppers begin to decide that you're something good to eat. So they wanna crawl all over you. Um, that's not exactly the best of things. So you have to, have to really watch out for them. You can imagine what it's going to be like in that day. So they have the power to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So if they want to do it, they can, because God has given them the authority to do it. Now, what takes place is that the beast who comes up out of the sea, out of the abyss, will make war with them. That's Antichrist. That's Satan himself. He comes out and makes war with them. He fights against them, and he's able to overcome them. 
realize this when you're fighting against satan you aren't any battle for satan himself by god's power you are a battle for satan but only when he allows you the authority and the power to do that you don't have the ability to go over him it's only when you are depending upon the lord that you can accomplish that task that's why the word of god seems to indicate to us always that we ought to allow the lord to influence our life to fill our life to work through our life because if we don't we have real problems and Satan is going to be able to overcome these two witnesses, and he's going to be able to kill them. And according to scripture, they are going to be in the city of Jerusalem, dead, lying in the street, visible where everybody can see them for three and a half days. And the whole world, scripture says, will be excited about that. The instrument that's going to make that possible is something that wasn't available 50 years ago. It's a cell phone. You know, uh, I had to call yesterday because we had a problem with uh, our service at home. Couldn't get something on the screen. I like caller ID and they couldn't get it up on our screen. It all of a sudden quit. Um, and they're saying, oh, well, you don't have your TV service for the moment. You can use your cell phone and get it on that. You can get it on your tablet. You can do it this way, that way. So you could keep watching TV if you wish to. And of course, with that, that means you can see things that are happening. How many of you have been watching some of the incidents that's been happening in, Jer in Jerusalem, in Israel, and watching the hostages be released? It's really exciting in its own respect. However, the real problem comes with the aspect of it that everybody is going to be able to see everybody's going to be able to hear and the indication is here that the world is excited about the death of these two men in other words they're not repenting they're not turning away from their evil ways they are actually happy that the beast has been able to destroy these two men and they are lying in the streets and they're giving gifts to one another how many of you have seen somebody die and you give a gift to somebody else? That's kind of sickening, isn't it? Because we don't do it that way. What we do do in any case is we, we give gifts when we want to remember somebody or we give something that was a person's possession to say, wow, isn't this great? Uh, they want you to have it. An inheritance type thing. This is not an inheritance. This is... The Easter Bunny has come to town and we're going to have fun. This is where they're saying, wow, we killed them now here. Have a present. Because it's worthy of a present. So after three and one half days, as they sit in the city of Sodom and Egypt, which is also the place where Christ was crucified. In other words, it's Jerusalem. After three and a half days, they will allow their bodies to be laid in a tomb. Then those who were on the earth will rejoice and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because of the two prophets. And after, verse 11, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who watched them. That's going to be a shock. What would the earth have done if the open casket, sometimes of one of our presidents or one of our leaders, if the person who was in the casket after two or three days all of a sudden got up? Mm -hmm. oh. Ladies and gentlemen, look at this. Watch this. He was faking it. Uh -huh. Well, the fact is that after three and a half days, if they're in the, a, 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 a tomb type situation, there's no way they can be faking it anymore. Right. So at least after three and a half days, they come forth. Now, interesting that it's three and a half days. Why? Because just about everything in this book is three and a half years. So now we have a situation in which it's three and one half days. And after the three and one half days, they rise to their feet and the world is watching them. And all of a sudden, 
they hear from heaven a saying to them, come up here. Then the world is going to be even more shocked because these two men that just rose back from the dead because the breath of life was breathed back in their nostrils by God, they're going to ascend into heaven in front of everyone. And it's probably going to be very similar to what took place by the Lord when he ascended into heaven. So when he ascends into heaven, it's going to be um, a terrifying time for their enemies. And they went up into heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. Now, here's where we just about ended the last time that we were looking at this passage. And at that time, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. One tenth of the city of Jerusalem is going to fall. And it says here that about 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. Now, most say that it's probably a, a round number there. Uh, although 7,000 could be the exact number of those who are killed, uh, God is very, very good at doing what he wants to do exactly as he wants to do it. So there is a large number of people who are killed in the earthquake. What happens? And the rest were terrified. 7,000 in the city of Jerusalem are killed. Everyone else is terrified. Now, there is a phrase there that gives us something that's very important. And gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, here is one of the things that's kind of hard to say. It is possible for someone to recognize that Jesus is God and not be saved. How do you do that? Well, the demons saw Jesus and says, what do we have to do with you, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to judge us before the time? Scripture tells us in James that the demons believe also and tremble. They don't, they don't uh, just believe, they believe and tremble because they're watching out for judgment. So it's possible to give glory to God. You are God but I'm not going to trust in you. But at the same time, there are other people who take a look at this passage who believe that these are Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem who will be saved because of these two witnesses ascending into heaven because they give God the glory. And that glory is also indicated in chapter 16 where there's a large quantity of Jews who actually come to know the Lord. So the question is, which is it? Are they being saved or are they just saying they believe? And the answer is, I don't know. I can't say emphatically. What I can say is that the scriptures are accurate, that they will give God the glory. God did this. God took them up to heaven. God did this. But whether or not that indicates that there's a belief to salvation on the part of the ones who say that, I don't know. And in faith give God the glory. Your, what? Your faith gives God the glory. Yes, it does. And their faith may have. Well, basically what you have, Bob, is you have one of those situations in which you can say that, well, there are lots of people in the United States who say, I believe in God. Have they done anything about it? Have they actually accepted Jesus Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior? Are they trusting in him? Or are they still working for their own salvation? Are they doing it the way they want to? What? Yeah. Now, if you give God the glory and depend and trust and rely upon him, yeah, you're saved. There's no doubt about that. So we do know that a large quantity are going to be saved. Let me just show you what uh, MacArthur says on that. I have a little bit here in, in his commentary that he talks about here. If I can find it real quickly. A general, a genuine experience of salvation of the Jews, Luke chapter 17, verses 18 and 19, 
in contrast to those who blaspheme and refuse to glorify God in chapter 16, verse 9. This makes a key fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, and chapter 13, verse 1, and Paul's in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. So he's linking it with those verses, saying that this is a time when all Israel starts to believe and starts to trust and starts to rely upon God. It's possible. At the same time, it is possible to say that this is just those who recognize what, that God did this, but, and give God the glory for doing it, but they don't believe. It's really hard to say. Um, it's pretty hard to go against MacArthur. It's pretty hard at the same time to go against Bob Thomas. That's the other guy that I use for commentaries all the time. Both of them say it's saved people. At the same time, there are individuals like Warren Wiersbe who say they're not saved that they are actually just those who are going. So there's a, a lot of discrepancy here. The one thing I do know this, that if a person accepts Jesus Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior, God's got them. God has it, yes. But, but the, 100, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists are already out. Evangelizing. Oh, that's been happening a long time ago. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. 144,000 Jewish evangelists are already there. You have a lot of people who've already been saved who actually have died for their faith. They are in heaven. They are the ones who have asked God to judge the earth. And why are you waiting, Lord? And he's just telling them to wait a while. All of that is happening. I didn't have all my notes after this, but I thought that was already going and I'm just lost. <laughs> okay. You know, keeping everything chronologically together is really hard, isn't it? Okay. With that... Let's take a look at verse 14. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So there are three woes that were expressed by the angel back in chapter 10. Now we have here the second woe done. That was the, the sixth uh, trumpet. And we have now the seventh trumpet given to us in verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded... And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worship saying, we give thanks, Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign and the nations were enraged and your wrath came and the time came for the dead to be judged and the time to be reward to reward your bond servants the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name the small and the great and to destroy those who destroy the earth and the temple of God, which is in heaven, was open, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightnings, and sounds, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstone. Wow. Lots there, huh? Let's go through it. We have the seventh angel sounding. He's blowing the trumpet. When the trumpet is blown, here we have not a voice saying from heaven, but voices saying from heaven. There'll be a great multitude of heavenly voices peeling forth with the statement that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, we have the trumpets here. The vile judgments are still to come. But the statement, because the out of the seventh seal came the seven trumpets, out of the seventh trumpet comes the seven vials. So we really have seven judgments that are manifested in 19 different ways. 
And what we are having here is it seems as if it's already completed to the extent that you can say that the kingdom of the world is now the kingdom of our Lord. He is coming. He's taking charge. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And he shall reign forever and ever. If you quote the Messiah that uh, is sung oftentimes. It is just very, very clear there. You'll notice that the four and 20 elders whom we've identified basically as the church. That's what I think it is in this particular case. The four and 20 elders who sit on their thrones before God, they fall on their face and they worship the Lord. There's going to be a lot of times when we just stand in awe of what God has done and who he is and the authority that he has. And we're just going to fall on our face before him. You got a prayer sheet tonight, right? How many items were there on the prayer sheet? 42. I don't know. Are you able to keep track of all 42? Yeah. I tell you, it's pretty hard to just go through the... the the 42 that are on the list and the two that we added after that and keep it all straight in such a way that we can remember everything that is happening. Do you know that the Lord understands every thought and every intent of every man and every woman who has ever lived? He knows everything that is taking place. He is all-knowing. Nothing takes him by surprise. You can't fool him. You can't trick him. You can't do anything like that. And he is coming back to rule the earth at exactly the time that he chose. And it is going to be his kingdom. And then we are going to see that taking place. And we are going to go, yes, and we're going to fall on our face and worship the Lord. Don't worry. You won't have any problem in those days because there won't be any aches or pains either. So you'll be able to do that. And you'll be able to do it with real ease. Get and you, get back up. <laughs> and you'll well, be able to get back up again too. Yeah. Because uh, you'll have a, a body that's just like his body. And it will last forever and ever. And we will worship the Lord. Any barriers to worship that are here won't happen there. You won't have the difficulties that cause you to, to space out, to not be able to concentrate, to not be able to, to really focus on what you need to do. And that's a, a real blessing because let's face it, there are some times where it's pretty easy just to let your thoughts drift and you get away from it and you say, you know, I had one guy say, did you, I had two men at, the, at a conference saying, I was supposed to read all the announcements. And I had a whole list of announcements, 38 of them, that I had to read in about four and a half minutes. And when I got all done, these two guys were coming up to me and they were saying, did you say this? I said, yeah, I did. Did you say that? Yes, I did. Why didn't I hear it? I said, because you were talking behind me. <laughs> and basically what it amounted to is that they weren't listening to the announcements because they had heard them before. So they wanted... And then the question is, did you cover that? Did you cover that? Did you cover that? You know, we won't have to worry in heaven because we will have focus. We will be able to go through it. Now, notice what those four and 20 elders say. We give you thanks, Lord, God, all the almighty, the one who is, who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. You are God. You are the almighty God, all powerful. You are the one who has always been, who always is, and always will be. He is the eternal God. He is one who is there forever and ever. And you have taken your great power He's all powerful and you have begun to reign. When God comes and reigns upon this earth, when he comes and sets up his kingdom, when he rules during the millennial kingdom, you're going to have a thousand year peace. 
you're not only going to have a thousand year peace, you're actually going to see total justice. You're actually going to see total justice done. And that is going to be something that is just absolutely amazing. God will understand not only all the problems, but he'll be able to solve those problems. He'll be able to work through his children. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to be reigning with him in cities all over this world. We'll have the opportunity to serve him. You know, some of you may be the, the mayor of... Uh, Brooklyn or Chicago, sorry to mention Chicago, uh, I'll probably get, uh, you know. You'll get Chicago. I'll get Gwynville, Indiana. I'll probably get uh, Gila Bend. Gila Bend. <laughs> yeah, Arizona. That's where, if you blink twice, you're through it. Mm -hmm. I one time was in Spry, Utah. There is a Spry, Utah, in front of Spry Mountain. You know what the population is? Seven. Four. Three. Three. Three, <laughs> Three people. Like Mara Beach, New Mexico. That may be more than I can handle. <laughs> Let's face it that way. You know, it says, we thank you. We give you thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is, who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were raged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Wow. What's he going to do in his rule? First, he is going to judge the nations. Psalm chapter 2, why do the nations rage? He's going to judge the nations. Those who are wicked are going to be judged completely. At the same time, it says that he is going to reward your bondservants. There's two types of judgments. There's a judgment for, there's judgment that is for wrath and for penalty. And then there is a judgment that is for reward called the Bema Seat. The Bema Seat judgment will be done for God's bond servants, the prophets, and the saints who feel your name, whether you are small or great. You'll have some that are, are just simple believers, and they, they are going to be judged just like the great ones will be. And God will reward each according to what their faithfulness was. And it says... He will have the small and great to destroy those who destroy the earth. Um, he is held back in judgment for all this time. Now he's going to execute judgment. He's going to bring it forth. And it's going to be righteous in every way. Scripture then talks about a temple. And the temple is in heaven. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened. There is going to be a renewed temple upon the earth during the tribulation period. And there will be sacrifices started again. But there is going to come the abomination of desolation in that temple where Satan is going, where Antichrist is going to proclaim himself to be God. But there is a pure temple in heaven where God is. And scripture indicates that his ark will be there and his covenant that he made will take place because of it, uh, which is in heaven. And the ark of his covenant appears in his temple. That ark had the tablets of God in it. It had the manna in it. And it was where the mercy seat of God was. So the mercy of God is for those who are saved. You have the manna and you have the word of God, which is our strength and our source of strength. And it's going to be in heaven for all time. And there's going to be flashes of lightning that speaks of power, sounds and peals of thunder indicating the might of God. And at the same time, earthquakes and a great hailstorm. 
all of those will take place. Now that's what I missed last time, all of that. So we're not gonna get to the other chapter until next week. Uh, so we just basically picked up with chapter 11. Any questions on this part? Are the lightning and rumbles, peals of thunder and earthquakes going to be in heaven? Well, the, the, they're going to come or emanate from heaven, yes. They'll emanate from the presence of God. Uh, an earthquake going to come from heaven. His will will do it. Um, it doesn't give us the specifics as to how it's done. It just says there'll be an earthquake. Uh, what? How many of you have actually felt a big earthquake? What's the biggest one you felt? Uh, six. Six. Okay, you got a pretty big one there. There's been sixes and sevens and five fives in Southern California. We had them periodically. And, it, and I tell you, when you have a small one, it's nothing. It's just, you know, we 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 watched a four, and a four, the clothes and the pause would just kind of go back and forth a little bit. You have a, a a light on a on a on chains, it will rock. That was in the Seattle area. No, oh. we then have had earthquakes in San Dimas, and you know the uh, ten freeway, which is all built totally on stilts, the whole thing so that they can have parking underneath it, part of it fell. If you were up in San Francisco area, when they had the earthquake at the uh, World Series, half of the big, some of the bridges there fell at that time. So earthquakes can get really, really hard in their own regards. And when you watch what takes place, um, I think they showed one time that an earthquake happened and the truck, was up the top uh, and the part of above him was gone and the part below him was gone. And he, he's just stuck there until they can get him down. Uh, they're fearful in their own regards. You never know when they're gonna come. All of a sudden you feel the rumble and all of a sudden you know that uh, it's not right and it builds in its intensity. And you know how you hear a railroad for a, for a tornado? rumble of a railroad happens for an earthquake too. Yeah, you hear it before you feel it. You start to, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can sense it. And when you sense it happening, you all of a sudden go, oh, this is an earthquake. <laughs> well, is it gonna be a small one or is it gonna be a big one? And you can go, well, it's, this one's a small one. And then the next one you go, oh, this, you know, it's gonna be a small one. No, no, this is a bigger one. And then you go, how big is it going to get? How big do earthquakes get upon the earth during the tribulation period? So great that every island in the world vanishes. Think about that at one time, not separate times, one time. And we'll cover that in a few weeks. All the Hawaiian, all the illusions, all of the... Tahiti and all that other stuff. Well, I'll be gone. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, they'll be gone. And we'll have big islands. Madagascar? I don't know. Big island. <laughs> well, put it this way if God calls it an island in his book, it is gone. <laughs> it's gone. You know, what it basically amounts to is you have to realize that it's God who's in control. We don't have to say, well, Australia isn't a continent. Australia is an island. God could say that. I guess we won't. Well, we won't know. We'll be up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will be. If the water um, surrounding it, there's some fire. I don't know if you've watched it at all, but uh, David Jeremiah has been talking about the great disappearance. One of the things that is kind of amazing to that in, uh, uh, with all the medical things that happen in this particular church, uh, I find it kind of humorous in its own respect. 
that they show a doctor going, washing his hands, getting ready to go in and operate upon a patient and she's on the bed and the nurses are running around trying to get things ready and all of a sudden she disappears. Doctor should have next. Now. <laughs> no encouraging. <laughs> now, what would you think if uh, the doctor cut you open and he's gone? <laughs> Oh, wow. But you wouldn't know because you'd be passed out. But for us, it was about they would be running around like crazy. The anesthesia on the last so long, the uh, uh, boy. We're uh, on our way down, and the pilot disappears. Whoops! There's going to be a lot of a lot of tragedies that happen like that. I would recommend the book that you were just talking about from Lady Jeremiah. I bought it and it's mm -hmm. excellent reading. He does a good work. Uh, you know, he, he will be gone from his pulpit for weeks on end. Uh, sometimes his son preaches and sometimes others people preaches. And uh, that's when he goes away and he, he writes a book which basically is his sermons. Yeah. So he writes his sermons out. And he's able to read mm -hmm. his sermons in such a way that uh, it doesn't sound like he's reading. He's a very gifted man yes, he is. in his own respect. And he's got a lot of things on his plate too. Well, anyway, we'll pick up with chapter 12 next week where we'll review what I've already covered and then we'll cover the rest of it. How's that? Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we've had to be here tonight and to look at that seventh trumpet when, Father, your son will come back and reign here upon the earth. He takes it over. It's always been his. He then will rule upon this earth. And he will show power and authority over all. Those who are wicked will be judged and see the wrath of God in their life. Those who are saints will have the judgment of rewards, and each one, whether great or small, will receive their reward from the Lord, and he will judge their faithfulness to him. And Father, you are going to cause this earth to be correctly judged at that time. How thankful we are that we can trust that although things are a mess right now, although there's wars and rumors of wars everywhere, although there's sickness and plagues, although there's pestilence many places, although there's immorality everywhere, God, there is coming a day when your son is going to put all things back in order. And we can praise you for that. That day isn't far away. Lord, we're thankful that the next event on the scene is the rapture of the church. But God, we pray that we, knowing that, and knowing what will take place during the tribulation period, will make it our priority to live godly lives now and to speak to others and share with them and warn them about the judgment that is coming. Help us to that, and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>